I mean that we don't talk about money and we don't talk about investing enough with our friends, at least in my experience. And no, I same agree. with family. It's kind of a topic that I, people feel a little weird talking about, and it shouldn't be. It should be a topic that you can talk about your salary with your friends. You should talk about your salary with your friends. Why, why do you feel like it's that important? Because I think that you kind of get pigeonholed into believing I'm doing the right thing and I'm taking the right steps because this is what everyone else has done in the past. And like, this is what mom and dad told me to do and, and this is what my boss is telling me to do. But that may not actually be the right decision. What maybe you should be doing is seeing if you have a friend with the same job title, how much are they making? Are you guys making the route the same? Do you guys have the same duties? What about what are they investing in? Are you guys trying to invest in the same companies? You know, gauge what's of interest to your friends because you'll find that your spending habits, your financial wellness does actually meet up with the other people in your age group and maybe more so than mom and dad or your boss. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I am super fired up today to have the one and only Catherine Ross with me today. Catherine, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for uh, spending the time with me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. So uh, we're going to have, to have a ton of fun. Like I just told you, I was just watching you uh, about an hour ago um, performing an interview. You're a, you're a video correspondent and host for The Street. Um, you're the host of The Street's live show with Jim and Kramer and Catherine Ross and the host of the video that I was watching, Action Alerts Plus Daily Rundown Show, um, and you've interviewed people like Shaq, Richard Branson, Al Roker, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, and I know you had an interview with him that uh, kind of blew up towards the, the beginning of the pandemic, but the way I kind of want to get started today, Catherine, is to kind of give everybody and give me a little bit more context on you and kind of how you've gotten to where you are in, in your career right now, and I think if I understand correctly, you work for the street and a little bit with Sports Illustrated. Is that correct? Awesome. So if you could just give us a few kind of a, a few minute rundown of kind of like how you got to where you currently are in your career, then that'd be great. So I work for Maven and Maven owns mm. um, the street. And then they also have licensing rights to Sports Illustrated. I believe I'm saying that correctly. Okay. Um, so therefore, I get to both work with my team over at the street. And sometimes I get to collaborate with Sports Illustrated, which is a ton of fun because I do love my colleagues over there. Um, how I got here. Well, first of all, it's kind of weird to be in the one that's being interviewed instead of the interviewer. Um, yeah. But I do have to say, I never really studied finance in school. I was never really huge in math. So after I graduated from college, I had done a lot of prison journalism, going into uh, maximum security women's prisons and working with them, teaching them about journalism. And then I ended up just kind of falling into reporting on personal finance. And from there, I made the jump to stocks and just kind of taught myself everything that I know. And Jim saw me uh, doing some kind of video one day and thought that I had talent and decided to bring me on as a video correspondent, which is fantastic. Awesome. So I, I almost like, I felt like I heard you wrong in the beginning when you said prison journalism. I'm not really sure what that, what that means, but so what was like, you made it sound like it was kind of a seamless transition from that into like learning about finances, but like, what, what was that jump look like? Because like you said, you didn't study really finance in school, you weren't big into math. So what sparked you to make the jump? Actually being in the prison system with these women, and, and by being in, I mean working with. Um, <laughs> learning, just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah be clear there. <laughs> um, working with these women, one of their biggest concerns, especially for post-prison life, was finances and how do you get your finances off the ground? You know, one thing that I've realized is that we just don't teach Americans about their financial well-being in school or in college. That's kind of like a specialty thing that you have to kind of pursue. And to me, that should be a right. That should be your home ec class. You right. know, you should be learning about economics, maybe not sewing like I used to do. Um, so that interest sparked me wanting to learn more about the industry, reporting on it, because I've always wanted to be a journalist. And I just got lucky with where I ended up. Nice. So were you like, when you when you kind of made the jump to maybe uh, I can't, what, were you a first reporting on finances or what, what was like the fish, first role when you made the jump? Personal finance. So Personal I was reporting finance. on just you know how how you approach your credit cards mostly. Yeah. Were you were you kind of like nervous going into it, not knowing, not really getting formal education on it, and just kind of like you said, self teaching yourself? So were you were you kind of like nervous and not really sure how you're going to be at it? Yes, so nervous and. 
it's also kind of led to an imposter syndrome, especially over the past three or four years as, as I've really worked with Jim and started to see my career kind of take off more than it had before. I, it is, it's struggling, you know, it, you sometimes wonder if you're doing the right thing for the right reasons. But I, I have to say that it also gives me kind of an advantage that I don't know that someone who went to college for this would have, where I really understand where someone's coming from when they're first learning about investing. So for me, seeing all these, for example, Robinhood investors come into the market over the summer, it was actually very, it was a nice breath of fresh air because I understood where they're coming from. I understood kind of the trends that they looked at because I was reporting on that already. And it was an easier transition than it might have been for a bigger financial media. Yeah. So I think a lot of people probably have a, a very similar experience to you in the sense that they go into something feeling like they might not know as, as much as they could and, and maybe having some sort of imposter syndrome. You know, there's the phrase for a reason. A lot of people, a lot of people have that. What would your like message of advice be to those people who might have that and really like the former version of yourself like early on in order to try to like overcome that and not let not let it like hold you back my message of advice is you're doing all the work for a reason you are if you are sitting there and you're after work or before work you're sitting down you're reading the text you're trying to understand what you're doing then you're on the right track and you're doing the right thing you shouldn't feel like an imposter for that because you're you're trying to learn something that is so complex that that's why they teach it at school. So good for you because you're taking this more seriously in a way than you might have if you had gone to school at 21 to learn this. Um, and I think that one of the toughest things to do is just to step back and reassure yourself. And especially in my role, going back and re-watching interviews that you may not be proud of for whatever reason, um, learning from your mistakes is super, super important in any way, in any capacity that you can. Yeah, no doubt. I can um, definitely relate with that last part of going back and looking at some old interviews. I've done that uh, painstakingly myself. But um, one of the, so you, you, let's back up. You talked about how you kind of taught yourself personal finance because it's not really taught all that well in school. That's for sure. I was talking about that with somebody the other day. If somebody is listening and they're like, yeah, I feel that way too. I'm, I'm frustrated because I don't really know how to handle my personal finances. Like what is the best way for me to go about and learn that? Is it just watching a bunch of YouTube videos? Is it following particular people or what is like a, the self-education of personal finance look like? So I think it kind of depends on each person. For me, I'm not as much of a video watcher. So for me, it was a lot of buying books that kind of had to do with it. Whether it was, um, for example, when I was trying to learn more about the stock market, I actually started by reading like Andrew Ross Sorkin's book on um, the 2008 financial crises and just kind of went from there, like the top 10 books on that period and, and starting to learn why did this happen? And from there, putting together the like, the nitty gritty of it. So any term that they talked about that I wasn't sure of, I would look up on Google and then I could become more aware. The YouTube aspect is great. I mean, there's so many YouTube videos out there, especially if you're talking about finance nowadays and credit cards. Um, there's so many easy explainers to look up on YouTube and, and they're really digestible. And I think that you got to find what fits your speed, whether it's, you know, just reading a ton of articles, whether it's reading a book, whether it's looking it up on, on YouTube, but the beauty of the technology that we have at our hands right now is that you can teach yourself. You don't need to rely on other people, but you can, if you want, and there are classes out there as well. Yeah, no doubt. No. And I really like how you said, you know, meet yourself at the medium of learning that you enjoy. Don't watch videos. If, if you don't like watching videos, read a book, if you want to read a book and then look up stuff. Um, I think that's, I think that's really important. So let's, you, you, uh, talked about how you've kind of always wanted, wanted to be a journalist. Um, and I've been doing interviews over the last couple, two and a half years. So I'm excited to hear some pearls of wisdom. So what was like, if you had to give yourself like one piece of advice to the Catherine Ross, who was getting ready to do her first interview ever, like knowing what you know now, like what would, what would you tell her? Breathe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I can relate very, with that, which is why see? I laugh. Exactly. I'm a very anxious person. I don't always come off of that, like that on camera. I've been told that a lot, but in reality, I have anxiety disorder. And so it is actually very, very hard for me to meet people, especially now with COVID trying to meet people online. It's, it's very difficult because I very much kind of feed off of 
your personality that I'm, when I'm standing right next to you. So definitely breathe. And you always know more than you think you do. So for me, I'd always try to like kind of use an interview, like a last minute test and try to try to cram in all those questions that I had as memorizations. And it would mess with me. I would always end up stumbling over myself because the truth is I wrote those questions. I know them by heart. I just need to leave it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, no, I like that. I think, um, I relate with both of those in regards to breathing and, and trust yourself. Like you don't, sometimes you can, you can over prepare. I feel like sometimes and get in your own head about it. Um, so l- like you said, sometimes you, uh, you need to breathe. You, you, fo- you can feed off of the energy of the other person. And one thing that I ad- admire you for from watching all your interviews with Jim, and if you guys don't know who Jim Cramer is, you, you need to go look up who Jim Cramer is. Um, I'm not going to talk, uh, too extensively about that here, but, um, he is super, you know, all over the place sometimes. He, he can be talking about one thing and then he'll be looking at his computer and uh, he'll, his mind can go all over the place. How do you stay calm and stay patient when that kind of thing happens? It's a lot of, so the funny thing is that my uncles are from Philadelphia and that's where Jim is from. And so okay. I kind of know that personality of almost too smart for themselves and their mind is just it's going to be 10 steps faster than you are right now so for me it's kind of like to stay calm and know that I'm five steps behind and my five steps are probably where the viewer is so let's take him back and let's re-explain you know if he suddenly goes uh for example there's one time on the New York uh, Stock Exchange floor where the CEO of HP walked by us and Jim immediately jumped in that while I was still like in the mindset of, okay, I got to ask these questions. And I had to remind myself, okay, turn into the camera, let yourself breathe, tell them, tell your viewers who this guy is that's walking up to Jim right now, and then turn around and try to engage with both of them. It's like, you have to think of it in slow motion when you're working with someone who is that fast. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think, I think it's hilarious because he, he just, cracks me up on uh, so many of those different interviews. So we, we talked about how I, I mentioned how sometimes you can over prepare and, and you, you know, you talked about how sometimes you can analyze the questions too much and get in your own head about it. What does like a good preparation for an interview for you look like? Like, do you, are you spending a decent amount of like, how much time are you spent going over your questions? How much are you really like, no, like sticking to the exact script? I know, I know your, your interview, like, your interviewing format is different than mine is, so it's going to be a, a little bit different. But I'm just inter- interested into what your preparation kind of looks like. It kind of depends on how how well I know the person um, that I'm interviewing. If it's some, if it's a CEO that I've interviewed a couple of times before. I might write down a couple of questions to get them okayed by my producer and then just kind of go off script with them. Um, But if it's someone new, then I tend to kind of line out, especially with like an IPO interview, initial public offering, I want to hit on specific things about what, why are they taking their company public? And so I'll go into more depth and bring that to my producer as kind of like the backup. He's going to check it over, make sure that I'm editorially correct. And then I'll go more into a script there. Um, with Jim, uh, it's more of like, I get all these questions. Okay. And it's 50, 50, whether I use them all, or if I go off script, um, because we like to just kind of sit there and play. And I think that's what makes the show so special. Yeah, no doubt. And and I asked the question because I think that preparing for an interview is, is translatable to any kind of preparation. I think one preparation in one area translates to a preparation in another area. If somebody's here listening and they have, you know, a presentation that they have to give at work, then being able to prepare to a certain level, um, I think that I think that's uh, pertainable. So that's why I wanted to ask the question. So we talked about how you got interested in finance. You know, you worked um, in the prison there, and we're, and we're helping the ladies to to talk to somebody more like specifically about the stock market. If they're listening to this and they're like, Catherine, I'm not in the stock market because I don't know anything about it, but I know I need to be where do I start? Like, what's your answer to, to them? My answer is that's where YouTube videos come in. If you mm-hmm. don't know what you're doing, the best thing that you can probably do is start watching YouTube videos, decide what kind of investing strategy fits your needs. A lot of my friends um, text me because they have Robin Hood nowadays. And so they'll text me being like, Hey, look at what I'm doing. And I, and I, I'm a journalist, so I can't give any opinion on what stocks they're trading. And I can't, um, owner trade any stocks myself, 
But it is fun to see, you know, how everyone is approaching the stock market because the beauty of technology, again, is like places like Robinhood allow you to have this accessibility that you might not have had in your early to mid 20s. You know, the stock market might have been something that you waited on until you had a little bit more money to invest. But nowadays, you that five dollars that you wanted to put to towards your Starbucks coffee that you no longer need, you can go ahead and hop on an app and put, and invest it there. And I think that that is it's really good for people to learn in small doses how to invest their money. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm trying to figure out what, if somebody like, what, how would you stress the, let's like say somebody is listening and they're kind of on the flip side of things. They're like, I don't really feel like I need to be in the stock market. I don't really feel like I, I need to be investing like that's too, or not, not necessarily like I don't need to be, but it's like too confusing. I'm not going to do it. It's not for me right now. I'll do it later when I learn about it. Like how, how would you stress like, like, no, it, it kind of is really important. Like what would your kind of approach be to that person who's kind of pushing it off? What are your retirement plans? I mean, what I don't think that I'm a millennial. So for, I always say my generation, when I am referring to younger generations, I don't think that what we wholeheartedly understand is that there may not be social security benefits by the time that we're ready to retire. And in that case, how are you going to save that money? How are you prepared for retirement? And yes, you can just rely on your company's 401k and that's totally okay if that's what you're comfortable with, but you can also start to pad the bank. And even if you're trying to save up for a home or for a car, one of the best ways to do that is to consider investing a small amount of money and let it grow. And even if you don't think that you need it, maybe it's time just to try, you know, just put a little bit of money, try, I don't want to say playing with it because I don't think that we should equate the stock market with like gambling in any way, but mm -hmm you know, at least attempt to get out of your comfort zone because you never want to end up in a place where you don't have any finances to fall back on. And we know from all of these studies that are being done that more and more Americans don't really have savings. So if that's the case, perhaps it is time to try to grow wealth by investing it instead of trying to earn it. Yeah. So, and kind of to touch on one of the things that you said, it's, it's not play money. It's not some it's not related to to gambling at all so for all the people who are young out there and who maybe do have robin hood accounts and, and maybe are thinking it is a little bit more like gambling like what are the what are the risks of trying to invest without really having much knowledge behind do it, why you're doing what you're doing i think one of the biggest risks that i've seen and or at least watched on the internet is people jumping into something like margins trading or options trading without really understanding what it is. And those are, I mean, those are more complex than just putting a money into a stock. So if you're going to dive into those sections of the market, which are totally open for um, average investors, retail investors, as we call them, do your research first. Like the, like you really need to sit down, understand what you're getting into before you start playing around with the app. Yeah. I, I agree. I think um, I think because it is so accessible, it leads to people not doing a lot of the research and going into it a little bit uneducated, which it can be one of the risks of making it so accessible, I feel like. Yes, I completely agree with you there. I mean, I, Jim and I were talking earlier today, actually, about Airbnb and how it's great that everyone has this they love Airbnb as the brand, as the company, but th does that mean that you should be investing in Airbnb? Like, have you done your research? Have you done, as Jim says, your homework? Have you dived into what that balance sheet looks like? These are things that we're seeing younger investors maybe not do as much as previous generations. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I do think that you should still be at least doing the bare minimum before you decide to put money into a stock. It should be more than just, I booked a hotel or I booked a room on Airbnb. I really like this. So I'm going to buy their stock, you know? Yeah. I feel like it is kind of the balance of sometimes if you do too much ho homework or overanalyze, you stop yourself from, from doing anything. But if you don't do any homework, then you're risking a lot. So it's kind of finding a little bit of balance, I feel like. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and maybe it's the fact that 
it is harder for if you don't understand what a balance sheet looks like, or you don't understand what earnings, you know, what the breakdown of earnings are. It is, it's harder to get into that part of investing. And I, and I hear people there, but that's also why I would say at least then hop on like financial Twitter and try to look at what people are doing with their money. There's stock twits, for example, you can hop on there and gauge the interest that people are having, why they're investing in this stock. And then you can kind of backpedal from there. I'm not saying look at <laughs> tweets and decide to invest because of them, right. but rather use them as part of your research. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that. So to kind of go back a little bit to um, interviewing and, and how you've interviewed some people like Shaq, Al Roker, Richard Branson, Dr. Fauci, has there ever been a toughest interview where maybe like, it was either the, the toughest to prepare for or you were the most nervous for, or maybe it was afterwards and you're like, oh, that did not go well. Like that, that kind of sucked. Like, was there ever like a toughest interview you feel like? Okay. So it's kind of a tie between Richard Branson and Dr. Fauci. Richard Branson, because we are on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And if, if you don't know what that looks like, it's a very open place that has kind of like a receptacles for traders to be seated. And it was tough because it was the day that Virgin Galactic was going public. There was Richard Branson, the CEO of Virgin Galactic, and then the um, CEO of the SPOC, uh, the SPOC that they were um, merging with. So the issue there is for the camera work. And for me, my body language needs to be open with the three of them here. But when I've got one guy over here and one guy over here and I'm in the middle, it's like hard for me not to be turning my back which yeah. just led to me kind of being more and more anxious as the interview went on because I didn't want it to be seen as rude by my interviewees that I wasn't able to give them all the attention with my body language. Um, and just preparing for an interview with Richard Branson. I mean, he is so charismatic in person and very, very lovely as a human being, but I, there were, I could feel my heart um, going. And then with Dr. Fauci, the difficult part was I knew that I wanted to really dive into the mask debate. Why hadn't we been told to wear masks before um, we, before we were told what in, in April, maybe early May. Um, mm -hmm. And I knew that that was going to come off as either he would answer it or he would try to go away from it. Yeah. Deflect it. Yeah. So the issue was that as that question came on, I was trying to kind of, my body language was more, trying to be more welcoming. I was trying to smile. I was trying to be, you know, please answer this question kind of like I'm, I'm asking it to you. And I was actually kind of taken aback and surprised when he answered it honestly. And he said that they had known, but they had made a decision, the medical community, um, public health officials had made a decision to not uh, suggest wearing masks for Americans. And in my surprise, I just kind of moved on to, in my mind, what the next question needed to be where I really should have dug in and asked him why and you know, really made that the center of the interview. So of course I get off of the interview and the first thing that my producer asks is, well, we missed an opportunity. <laughs> and I was like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, well, I, I, like, I like both of those things. Um, and I'm gonna uh, kind of stick on that idea because it is sometimes tough to ask a question that would benefit other people and you would like to hear the answer from, but you're not really sure how they're going to take it. Or you think they, you know, they might be mad about it or they might be offended by it or something like that. And again, I think everybody can relate to that. I think everybody maybe hasn't asked their boss a question because they're scared that they're going to be mad at them for asking it, or they haven't asked somebody in the, in the, their significant other a question because they're, they're mad about it. And so like, with that being said, what can you, what can you do to like get over that? What can you do to be like, I need to ask this question. I don't care what they, I don't care if they're mad. Like this just needs to get out there. So one of my journalism professors, uh, Merrick Fuchs, he always told me it's the tough questions that need the answers. And so for me, it's, it's mentally preparing myself that I like to be liked because again, anxiety disorder, that's just, to me, I really want to be liked, but I'm also a journalist at the end of the day. And my job is to ensure that I'm getting the questions that the public wants to know. So you have to kind of combine those two and come to reality and, and just say to yourself, it, you got to take a deep breath and you have to answer this question, whether you like the answer or not, because it's important. Yeah. And I think that you can put that into real life perspective in that why are you avoiding this? It's, it doesn't help anyone that you're avoiding a question that needs to be asked. You need to know the truth. So however coping mechanisms work for you, for me, it's always a deep breath, but 
you need to you need to ask the question. Yeah, I think one of the uh, biggest untold lessons that I've learned from my dad is he is what I would say is unapologetically curious. Like I remember there are times when I was growing up where he would like ask uh, anybody something and I'm, and I'm like, me and my sister are like squirming, like, oh, why did he just ask that? That person's not gonna be happy. They don't wanna answer the question. But then like every single time the person didn't mind answering the question. And we, we kinda, I think sometimes we convince ourselves that the other person is gonna be more offended than they actually are going to be. And I think that's probably a little bit more relatable from like a, just a regular personal conversation point of view, more, more so than an interview point of view, but I, but I feel like it's it's still pertainable for like a, a lesson to take away is like be unapologetically curious because a lot of times they're not really going to care that you asked it. Exactly. And a lot of times actually you get respect for asking the question that doesn't, that nobody's bothered to ask before, which is kind of a win, <laughs> at yeah. least in my book. Yeah, no doubt. And I, I think that, no, I think that's huge. And I think that, that like to me would be the motivating factor to ask somebody. To, to gain the respect because a lot of times when you ask a question like that, they know that it was tough for you to ask and they're like, damn, like that was tough for them to ask. Nobody usually asked me that, like that person's legit. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. Um, you, you've been working with Jim. How long have you worked, uh, worked with Jim? I think we're on two and a half years now. Okay, okay. So I'm sure you've, learned a ton of different things from from him but one of the things I'm curious about is what is like two different lessons like one of the two of the biggest lessons that you've learned from him one being like stock market finances that side of things and then one maybe like a life lesson that you may have learned from him when reporting on the stock market be unapologetic um, and when you're going to approach a trade know what you want you know, set the terms, uh, set the limits that you want, know why you're investing in the company. If you really believe in it, then that's okay. You don't have to listen to the talking heads on any network channel. You know, if you really believe in the company and the balance sheet backs you up, then it's okay. You can invest in that company. And gotcha. as for personal, ooh, I would say Jim has taught me to be honest honest with myself and honest with other people, whether they want to hear it or not, whether I want to hear it or not, to be honest and accept honesty is something that we don't really do in this, um, as Jim would say, in this society. He, he actually called it today, I think he called it like a cancel society, which I don't, I don't love the term, but I would say that it's definitely, honesty is the best policy. You know, our moms taught us that for a reason when we were younger. And being honest, especially now when it's tough, is how you get further along, not only in work, but also in your personal relationships. Has there been a time since that you feel like is the biggest lesson, and it might be hard to come up with one right now, but has there been a time where you feel like you made the conscious decision of like, okay, I'm actually going to say, like, I want to say this, <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to actually say this because this is the honest thing. This is the true thing. This is what I should say. Definitely. I think it was, I think that would come more. It, that definitely was something that I fought with myself a lot more when I was earlier in my career, um, debating whether or not what I was saying was ethical or honest or, you know, how I should approach the question that I was asking. And nowadays it's, it's more of, if I'm saying the right thing, the facts will back me up. Hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I think, um, you d one of the, th the first thing I thought about when you said that is like the saying that you don't have to remember what you said if you were honest, like a lot of times people, like if you lie, then you have to remember the lie later on and you have to say it again. But if you're honest, you don't have to remember what you said because you just tell what actually happened. Yes. And I think that my sister would be the first one to tell you that I am a terrible, terrible liar and should never try that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, awesome. Yeah, I don't think I'm a, I feel like I would, I'm a terrible liar as well. I feel like I'd start laughing anytime uh, I try to lie. Um, not, I'm, I don't want this to be a uh, political leaning question, but how, what, I, I think it is, you know, we're in, we're in the season right now where there's being, where there's a, a presidential transition. How much does the president, again, I get it's a loaded question. How much does who the president is like affect the stock market? Do you feel like? I think it actually affects it quite a bit. Um, 
definitely right now, for example, if you wanted to use the last two weeks, um, since, you know, that's what I've been reporting on. <laughs> it's also, it's also a little bit, uh, and like, I want you to continue, but I feel like the last two weeks is also like a little bit different compared to normal times. <laughs> So that's actually a good point. So I'll start with, you know, when Trump was elected, that was actually a good win for the stock market because of all the tax breaks that companies got. So we saw kind of like, uh, we saw the stock market react positively to that. And then the funny almost juxtaposition to that was actually this election where it was thought that maybe a Biden win wouldn't be as good for the markets. And maybe even with the Georgia runoff races, which were, can you believe it, just last week, um, (laughs) that that also wouldn't be as good for the markets. But we've actually seen the market surprise us in that way, that they're taking in this and they're saying, actually, you know, with the with the policies that Trump had, there was a lot of uncertainty. One day we might get a tweet about Ch- the Chinese trade deal, whereas now with Biden, we know that that's going to be not, it's not going to be taking place on Twitter, for example. So that's a little bit more certainty. And then using the last two weeks, I mean, we've all seen what's happened. And we've seen now that corporations are kind of getting involved. So there's a lot that have pulled out from donating to any political campaigns, but also donating to specific campaigns, the, um, specifically the Republicans that voted against certifying the election. So we're seeing kind of like those in the market take a little bit of action. But the market also is a very forward-looking mechanism. So it's already kind of baked in the Biden win. It's it's looking forward to what's the stimulus plan going to be? Um, how are we going to get everyone vaccinated? So it is interesting that back in November, we saw the market react. And now ever since then, it's been kind of like, all right, smooth sailing until until we see where the vaccines are and maybe March. Yeah. Yeah, no, it'll be, uh, it'll be certainly interesting to see what, what happens when... In, in March when, you know, more and more people get vaccinated. Um, but to, to kind of change tones a little bit um, and kind of reflection of your career, has there been a most important decision that you've made? Again, in reflection of, of kind of your career journey, has there been a most important decision that you've made that you didn't realize the significance of it at the time, but you kind of realized the, the importance of it now? Honestly, joining the street. Um I think that when I first interviewed for the job, they asked me what my favorite stock was. And this was still when I was, you know, learning about the stock market. And I said Netflix because I like to stream a lot of movies and TV shows. And back then, (laughs) that kind of, I'm sure that the editors who interviewed me kind of saw through that. But now that's actually like, that's how, as we've talked about before, that's how people invest. They like a product, they invest in it. And so I think that unbeknownst to me, just making that career choice and then deciding once I did join the street that I would be okay doing videos, that kind of led me on a path that I never thought I would have been on. Um, And it's led me to not only be more comfortable with myself and not only be more comfortable with my career choices, but for me to grow as both a person and a journalist to understand how to properly cover not only the stock market, but also as we talked about politics. I mean, in this country right now, it's very difficult for any journalist to talk about politics or to cover politics in a way that people aren't going to immediately take it the wrong way or try to read into something that was meant to be in a neutral tone. Right, right, yeah, no doubt. Um, Okay, so to go back on um, investing for the last time, if what, in general, not even really speaking to a specific target market of whether people are investing now or they're not investing now, what would you see, what would you say are kind of like your overall top three like investing tips, if you will, for the, for the, in regards to the stock market? Okay. Number one. It's like, I didn't prepare you for that question, but I feel like you, you're like, okay, bang, bang, bang. I've got them. One, two, three. (laughs) I'm ready. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Okay. Number one is actually, I feel like some of my colleagues are going to be like, why did you say this? But I'm going to say, look at the trending stocks. I always do think it's it's important to see what's moving it. And you can even go on like Yahoo Finance and look at what what volume is moving the stocks the most. I don't care how you do it. Just, just look at what's moving and kind of take into account, you know, if the NASDAQ's down, why is tech turning in in such a way? Is it just like a normal move? Because that happens. There are sellers that come in. Or is there something more to it? 
Um, number two, don't, don't get yourself stuck in investing theses or listening to somebody that you don't necessarily agree with. Mm -hmm. Just because they're an expert does not mean that you need to be listening to them. Um, there's, there's, you can always, you know, go on your own path in a way. Don't, don't do it in a way that you're going to hurt yourself or your money, but do it in a way that makes you happy with your choices, especially financial choices, because you want to make good ones. Mm -hmm. And, um, number three, talk to your friends. I don't think that we, you know, I was what do you mean by that? I mean that we don't talk about money and we don't talk about investing enough with our friends, at least in my experience and same with family. It's kind of a topic that people feel a little weird talking about and it shouldn't be. It should be a topic that you can talk about your salary with your friends. You should talk about your salary with your friends. Why, Why do you feel like it's that important? Because I think that you kind of get pigeonholed into believing I'm doing the right thing and I'm taking the right steps because this is what everyone else has done in the past. And like, this is what mom and dad told me to do. And and this is what my boss is telling me to do, but that may not actually be the right decision. What maybe you should be doing is seeing if you have a friend with the same job title, how much are they making? Are you guys making about the same? Do you guys have the same duties? What about what are they investing in? Are you guys trying to invest in the same companies? You know, gauge what's of interest to your friends, because you'll find that your spending habits, your financial wellness does actually meet up with the other people in your age group and maybe more so than mom and dad or your boss. Mm. Yeah. I like that. I like that third one. I think that's not one that I was, uh, was going to think that you might come up with. So I like it. Um, all right, Catherine. Well, the second to last question here is, um, I think that in order to get closer to the best version of yourself, I I know my path for me is I try to gain clarity every single day on what I think the best version of myself looks like and what the best version of myself is capable of. And then my goal every single day is to try to reverse engineer that person into reality. And so a question that I found really beneficial for myself about like a year and a half ago is what I'm getting ready to ask you. And it's, is there a particular skill or piece of knowledge that the best version of yourself has that you don't yet currently have? Um, being able to read and digest the news at a higher volume than I am currently able to do. Whoa. Higher volume. Why? Because I think that everything impacts each other and that might not always be the case, but it's definitely in this time moment, definitely the case that, you know, what's going on in Washington, DC does have an overall impact on the stock market, though it might not be today. Um, coronavirus, how is that impacting the way that we operate? And so knowing what is exactly going on is super important, at least in my career, to better myself in this field. Mm. I thought you were going to say read and digest it in a way that it doesn't like <laughs> make you angry <laughs> or like high, super, super stressed or, or, or high, or high tense and anxiety. I don't know. Anyways. We'll definitely do that too. <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah. do that too. <laughs> but my therapist will tell you I can do my breathing exercises. So I've got that down. There you go. There you go. I like it. I like it. Well, uh, before I ask the last question, uh, Catherine, I want to acknowledge you for being able to, well, first off, like you didn't, like you said, you didn't go to school for finances. You weren't a math person, but then you, you were, you know, worked at a, worked in prison journalism. And then you found this area where you had to learn in order to help the, help these women. And then you made it a career. Like, I think that's really cool that like, you're not doing something that you went to school for and you like kind of taught yourself and you, you took that leap of faith of, of going into a position where you might've felt a little bit of imposter syndrome, but over the, over the years, I'm sure you've been able to learn it and grow it and realize you, you belong where you are. Thank you. And I think that's important. I'm not special. I want to make that very clear to everyone. You can like anyone who wants to do it can do it too. It's just all about the work that you put into it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, um, you guys need to make sure that you uh, go to the street.com where you can uh, find some of the interview. They're also on YouTube where you can find some of the interviews um, with Catherine and, and Jim and, and see more of her work. And if you want to follow her on Instagram as well, she's at by Catherine Ross. Um, anything else, anywhere else that you would send people to either go learn more about you or you think is a good place to go to learn more about stock market and investing, anything like that? 
as I said, try to go to stock twits. I don't have an active um, profile there, but definitely if you're trying to learn about what's trending in the market, what people are interested in, it's a great resource. Um, I post a lot on Twitter. Um, so you can follow me there at by Catherine Ross as well. And honestly, I've recently started looking at Reddit more, um, Wall Street bets specifically. Um, and so if people are interested in kind of looking at, especially what younger people are looking at, then I would say go to Reddit as well. Awesome. Awesome. Good stuff. Well, I'll make sure I link that stuff up in the show notes. But uh, last, last question here, Catherine, is I think that getting closer to the best version of yourself is a constant journey. I don't think we're ever to that best version of ourselves, And I also think it's a very unique journey. I think the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So for you personally, if there are three things that you can currently do or three things that you can currently work on to get closer to that best version of Catherine Ross that you could possibly be, what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Learn more. I'm always open to learning. So whether it's learning from an interviewee, whether it's learning from a book that I'm reading, um, learn more, be open to everyone. Um, I love when people, for example, DM me about stocks that they're watching. I may not always respond, but I'm looking at those stocks because you're looking at those stocks. And I guess be calm. <laughs> I'm going to bring that back up because I just think that that is how you kind of get through crazy times. And that's how you also get through normal times. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I think, uh, I think like, like you said, being calm is, and being able to take a deep breath is so relatable to like anything, anything crazy times or, or normal times. So I think that was a, a good way to finish it, but that's all we got today, Catherine. Uh, appreciate the time. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course.